important event and I would also like to extend my gratitude to all the experts who've joined uh, this uh, event today, which is a very meaningful expression of solidarity with the long-standing uh, struggle of relatives <coughs> and survivors for truth, justice and accountability. I am going to present on behalf of Amnesty International a summary of our findings on how the extrajudicial executions and enforced disappearances resulting from the 1988 massacres also constitutes the ongoing crime against humanity of enforced disappearance. I will then talk about the crisis of systemic impunity that has prevailed in Iran from the uh, early 80s up to today and has therefore contributed to ongoing cycles of bloodshed and serious crimes under international law in the country. In 2018, for the 30th, for the 30th anniversary of the 1988 massacres, Amnesty International issued a 200-page report that concluded the 1988 massacres also constitute ongoing crimes against humanity. We therefore uh, focused on the systematic concealment of the fate of those killed and forcibly disappeared and the cover-up of the whereabouts of the remains. As we all heard uh, through the painful testimonies of the survivors and relatives this morning, in late July 1988, thousands of prisoners across Iran went missing. For months, no news of them was received. From October 1988, the worst fears of families uh, were confirmed. The authorities began calling many of them, summoning them to prisons, and uh, after uh, holding them in different rooms for various um, periods of time, uh, they told them suddenly and uh, verbally that their loved ones were no longer alive. In many cases, families only received just a bag containing the belongings of their loved ones. Sometimes they were not even given these last um, uh, remnants of their uh, loved ones. Also, throughout research, our, we found out that some families were never even given this minimum information about the fate of their loved ones. For months and sometimes even years, they were kept in total uncertainty about the fate of their loved ones. First, they were told that their loved ones have been transferred to another prison or a remote island somewhere in the Persian Gulf. Then they receive calls that their loved ones are no longer alive. Sometimes they learn several years later from the survivors that their loved ones were no longer alive. This uncertainty was also reinforced through these strange calls that many families across the country received from individuals believed to be affiliated with security and intelligence officials who promised uh, the families um, that the, some information about their loved ones will come true. This uncertainty, this deliberately inflicted pain and anguish on the families kept them in a lot of um, anguish uh, and uh, it resulted in many families remaining hopeful that maybe their loved one is alive. We, for example, heard from a survivor who, s who told us about an elderly mother who would um, go to uh, a prison in Semnon every week with a bag of carrots because his, her son had told uh, her that he suffers from uh, poor eyesight and would like to have carrots. And for two years after the massacre, this elderly woman would travel from her village to the main prison with a bag of carrots and every, t every Monday, the prison officials simply told um, her that they have no information on the current whereabouts of her son. And throughout this process, she gradually lost her mental stability. Or we heard from another uh, mother who kept um, waiting for her son for three uh, decades. And uh, every time um, the phone rang or the doorbell rang, uh, she would jump thinking that maybe this could be her son. Many families did not receive a, birth certi um, a death certificate for their loved ones. In some cases, they didn't seek a death certificate because of the climate of shock and fear at that time. Some of them um, did not seek a, birth certifi a death certificate as a deliberate act of resistance because the authorities had not provided the full truth about the fate of their loved ones and how they were killed. 
the uh, small number of families who sought death certificates were provided with inaccurate and misleading death certificates. From the ones that we reviewed, and unfortunately, we only managed to gather around a dozen death certificates. They contained very little information. Sometimes the date of death was not noted. In uh, most death certificates that we reviewed, um, the authorities had simply written that the individual had passed away and had not indicated that the death resulted from an execution. We also saw a number of shocking death certificates that said the individual passed away due to quote-unquote natural causes or from an illness. We also received accounts of families who were forced to annul the uh, identification booklets of uh, their loved ones. These are booklets in Iran that basically act as your birth certificate, marriage certificate, and the certificate for your children. And they were forced to annul these, uh, uh, these um, uh, identification booklets, and they, uh, otherwise they would face additional threats. And uh, in some of these, uh, the cause of death was, writ was written as having passed away from an illness or from a heart attack or having died at home. During this research, we also looked um, into the database of the organization of Behesh Zahra in Tehran, which is a state institute that uh, contains the records of grave sites, not only in Tehran province, but also in many other provinces across the country. We entered the names of over 4,000 victims who have been recorded by human rights organizations in the database and nearly 99% of the um, victims uh, had not been registered in this online burial record. This was also the case for the few victims that the authorities had identified an individual grave site for them in Behesh Zahra Cemetery. So even these individual grave sites in Behesh Zahra Cemetery are not recorded in the online burial um, database. It points to a deliberate attempt by the Iranian authorities to eliminate the traces of these victims and the horrific crimes that they have uh, committed. In um, addition, uh, it's important to note that even for these individual grave sites that the families have been referred to, there are serious concerns that these individual grave sites may actually be fake and empty. This is the fear that many victims' families expressed to us. We learned about a victim who had two individual grave sites in different corners of the cemetery, and there hasn't been any explanation from the authorities. We um, also uh, realized that uh, across the country, not a single family has received the body of their loved one, and only in very small um, uh, cases, uh, families were verbally told about the presence of um, mass graves that could contain the remain of their loved ones. Uh, these were in uh, five uh, cities. But officially and publicly, the Iranian authorities have never acknowledged that any mass graves exist in the country. Uh, this is why, over the past three decades, the authorities have systematically destroyed suspected or confirmed mass grave sites across the country. They have turned them into rubbish sites. They have bulldozed over them. They have buried them, hidden them beneath new individual burial spots, and the owners of these new individual graves have no information about the harrowing history of these lands. They have built concrete slabs, buildings, or roads over the mass grave sites. These suspected or confirmed mass grave sites are under the surveillance of the security and intelligence forces at all times. Families and um, human rights defenders report that they are frequently confronted by plainclothes agents when they try to hold commemorative, commemorative ceremonies in these places. There has been an absolute uh, um, system of impunity in Iran not only for these past and ongoing crimes against humanity related to the 1988 massacres, but also for 
other mass um, events of uh, human rights violations and crimes under international law. This is because of the uh, structure that exists in Iran that uh, basically ensures that uh, the, uh, the security forces and the bodies that commit human rights violations and uh, crimes fall under the same um, authority that appoints uh, high-level judicial authorities. It therefore completely robs the judicial system of any pretense of independence and impartiality. The supreme leader in Iran appoints the head of the judiciary, who in turn appoints the prosecutor general of the country. As we heard, the former head of the judiciary in Iran, who is now the current president, was a member of the Death Commission, Ibrahim Raisi in Tehran. The current head of the judiciary was the Minister of Intelligence from 2004 to 2009. This is consistent with a long-standing pattern where the authorities appoint senior security and intelligence officials to top-level judicial and prosecution bodies, the very bodies that must ensure accountability and justice in principle. We also have the severe intertwining of the security forces and the uh, the judicial bodies through various legal provisions that I won't get into here. As a result of all this, it's been meaningless uh, to call on the Iranian authorities to investigate when they have shown time and again that they are unwilling and there must be international efforts to ensure accountability because there is simply no path toward justice within this current structure that enforces impunity and in which those who are responsible for crimes under international law hold the very positions to which, um, to which uh, in principle, justice must be served. That is the reason that Amnesty International in 2018 urged um, the UN Human Rights Council to establish an international investigation in relation to these past and ongoing crimes against humanity. Unfortunately, the international community, when it comes to the UN political bodies, continued to fail the victims and the relatives who have not been heard by the international community for over three decades. Just to um, quickly recall what the international community failed to do. Between 1988, when Amnesty International first raised global awareness about these waves of executions, and subsequently in September 1988, the first cables were sent by the then extrajudicial executions reporter to the Iranian authorities, there was, a, at that time, there was a blanket denial from the Iranian authorities. The first response from the Iranian authorities was in November 1988, and they completely denied that any mass killings were taking place in the country. And they presented the executions that were being carried out as battlefield killings, linking them to the armed invasion of the PMOI, the, uh, the uh, People's Mujahideen Organization of Iran. In January 1989, the UN Special Representative at the time issued his first interim report and uh, confirmed that there are no doubts that mass killings were taking place in the country. He subsequently sent another report in January 1989 to the Iranian authorities in which he included a list of over 1,000 victims by name. The Iranian authorities responded later that year that uh, 140 of these victims were quote-unquote non-existent individuals. In subsequent replies, they, uh, they made claims such as the, some of these victims were alive and outside the country, others were studying at universities, some were in Iraq for work, others were, uh, were uh, uh, out of the prison and working, we interviewed uh, family members who have lost um, uh, their relatives, and through our research, we realized that the names of their loved ones were actually in these uh, lists of the official responses wherein they claimed these individuals were alive and studying at universities or working in Iraq. This is the level of 
blanket denial that the Iranian authorities were showing at that time. Sadly, despite this, and even though by the end of 1989, there was no question that thousands had been executed and buried in unmarked mass graves, this issue completely dropped off the agenda of the international community. There was no follow-up to these responses and to the reports of the UN Special Representative from 1991 onward. And this silence continued for all the way till 2016, when for the first time after decades, the late um, special uh, rapporteur Asma Jahangir for the first time included a small subsection on the 1988 mass killings in her report. After that, in 2018, Amnesty International issued its report, and subsequently, in we had greater references to the 1988 mass killings and the enforced disappearances analysis in the reports of the Special Rapporteur and the UN Secretary General. In 2020, September 2020, in a very uh, momentous breakthrough, uh, a group of UN experts, including the Special Rapporteur on Iran and the UN Working Group on Enforced Disappearances, issued a joint communication calling on the Iranian authorities to reveal the truth about the fate of the victims, the whereabouts of the remains, the, uh, the protection of uh, families and human rights defenders seeking truth and justice. The joint communication was unprecedented in the sense that it was around 20 pages. Um, the allegation letter, and it included very detailed information that had not been previously featured in any UN reports on the subject. Uh, in this uh, letter, the UN uh, experts uh, warned that these um, ongoing enforced disappearances may amount to crimes against humanity, and if the Iranian authorities fail in their obligations to ensure accountability, they would call for an international investigation. Later, we had also the reference to the call for an international investigation in the annual reports of the UN Working Group on Enforced Disappearances. However, we still do not have a follow-up um, call, a joint call from the UN Special Procedures for, uh, for an international investigation, considering that four years have passed since that communication, and the Iranian authorities have clearly shown once again that they are unwilling to investigate and fulfill their obligations under international law. In this current climate of systemic impunity, the only avenues for justice at the moment would be through universal jurisdiction. We therefore also urge um, uh, all relevant bodies to reiterate the call on countries to open um, Invest criminal investigations under the principle of universal jurisdiction with respect to these ongoing crimes against humanity. This is a call that Amnesty is now making with respect to the catalog of international crimes that have also been committed um, during the 2022 uh, protests after the death in custody of Mahsa Gino Amini. These have included hundreds of unlawful killings across the country, widespread torture, including rape and sec other forms of sexual violence that Amnesty has uh, documented, and ongoing harassment and persecution of families of those killed who seek truth and justice. The pattern of harassment, intimidation, and threats against the families of the protesters killed during the protest has very painful commonalities with the pattern of persecution that families of the 1988 massacre victims have experienced for decades. In the lead up to the first anniversary of the 2022 protests, we, uh, we issued a report documenting how the authorities have arrested the relatives, summoned them for interrogations, dismissed them from employment, banned them from gathering at the grave sites of their loved ones, we have also documented the destruction and desecration of the individual graves of the protesters who were killed in 2022. And it's all very clear that history has repeated itself in the absence of a firm response from the international community to hold the Iranian authorities accountable for their serious crimes under international law. We are very um, encouraged by the establishment of the UN fact-finding mission 
on the violations that took place during the 2022 protests. However, the gravity and the scale of the crimes committed in Iran require a more long-term investigative body that can gather and collate the evidence and ensure that the, um, the evidence can then be used, uh, is collected in a manner that can then be used in legal proceedings. For that, it's very crucial that the UN Human Rights Council expands its efforts on this um, uh, crisis of uh, impunity in the country. Uh, I think I'll uh, stop my remarks at this point. Thank you very much again for uh, this event. And uh, I also want to express my deep respect for the survivors and, um, uh, and relatives who have enabled the international community actually to, um, to build on their struggle and support this uh, cause for justice. Thank you.